My Lords, it's a great pleasure to follow the noble Baroness uh, Bennett. Uh, I don't want to speak about Lord Moylan's or my brother's bus shelters, but I do want to support what has been said by the noble Baronesses Heyman, Young, Parminter and Bennett and others about the use of public procurement as an instrument to advance environmental objectives. But, my Lords, public procurement is also a very efficient way by which government and public authorities can require high standards from and provide a good example to employers. This is an important aspect of fulfilling objective number two of clause 11.2 of the bill, maximising public benefit. Because, of course, every one of the public contracts to which this bill will apply requires workers to execute them. The United Kingdom has, a long, has long recognised public procurement as a particularly apt tool to protect and enhance wages and working conditions. The Fair Wages Resolutions of the House of Commons date back to 1891. Their final form was the Fair Wages Resolution of 1946, introduced by Labour and supported by the Conservatives. In his speech in support, Harold Macmillan said that the government, quote, in placing their buy buying power, and this is the story behind this resolution, should see that they do so only with the best employers and that they do not use their contracting power to do down the better employer and to get better prices from the bad employer. My Lords, at that stage, the Fair Wages Resolution had been elaborated from 1891, so that in 1946 it had two main components. First, government contractors and subcontractors were required as a condition of their contracts to observe those terms and conditions of employment which had been established for the trade or industry in the relevant district by joint negotiating machinery or by arbitration. Secondly, in the absence of such established terms, contractors had to observe terms no less favourable than the general level observed by other employers whose general circumstances in the relevant trade or industry were similar. Questions arising under the resolution were first re referred to the Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service for conciliation and, if unsuccessful, to the Central Arbitration Committee for decision. These provisions were generally duplicated by public authorities and public bodies as well as by the nationalised industries. In this way, wages, terms and conditions were driven up and good employers were not undercut by bad employers. Lords, the resolution was rescinded in 1983 by the then Thatcher government. In order to do so, it was first necessary for the United Kingdom to denounce in 1982 International Labour Organisation Convention 94 of 1949, the Labour Clauses Public Contracts Convention, which had adopted much of its text from the Fair Wages Resolution. Laws in industrial relations have, of course, changed a great deal since 1983. Then, over 80% of British workers still had terms and conditions of employment set by collective agreements negotiated between employers and trade unions. Most of that coverage was by national agreements in various sectors. So the abolition of the Fair Wages Resolution did not immediately have a great impact. But the policy and legislation of successive governments has now reduced collective bargaining coverage to something below 25% of the workforce. Indeed, less than 13% of workers in the private sector, where public contracts will be placed, have the benefit of collectively agreed terms and conditions. Consequently, my lords, today, the vast majority of the workforce are at the mercy of the labour market and employer diktat to set the terms and conditions on which they have to work. The national minimum wage is intended to protect the lowest hourly rate, but it cannot, of course, create the 
quote, high wage, high productivity economy, unquote, to which this government aspires. So, reversion to negotiated terms and conditions, as elsewhere in Western Europe, and as ad advocated by the, both the ILO and the OECD, see successive employment outlooks from 2017 onwards, and as proposed by the Fair Wages Bill now before the New Zealand Parliament, might well redress the falling, the falling value of real wages in this country, wages which are already lower in value now than they were 12 years ago, particularly in the lowest three quarters of the wage distribution, with the exception of the very lowest paid. Lords, this bill presents the opportunity to revert to the 1891 and 1946 precedents as a simple and powerful mechanism to drive up wages, terms and conditions and to prevent bad employers from undercutting uh, good ones. I'll propose an amendment to that effect if the government is unwilling to move uh, its own and I'd be happy to consider with colleagues how these principles might apply to overseas suppliers about which we've heard this evening. Lord, the, my lords, the bill also provides the opportunity to deal with any number of other workplace abuses. Here's the chance to make public contracts dependent on not behaving as P&O Ferries did, as my noble friend uh, Lord Whitty pointed out. Here's a chance to put an end to the noxious practice of fire and rehire, yeah. at least by public bodies. And if it be thought that public bodies don't resort to such tactics, Richmond on Thames College is an example of such a body which has threatened 127 lecturers with that very ploy. Again, if the government don't move such amendments in the absence of an employment bill, I would uh, wish to do so. Lords, there are a number, of course, of other good practices to encourage and bad practices to discourage, which, which this bill could achieve by way of conditionality for the grant of public uh, contracts. I won't take time now to go through them. The public procurement regulations... Sorry. Lords, just one further point. The public procurement regulations, which are to be displaced by the current bill doesn't do any of the things I've mentioned. But one thing that those regulations did do, and it's Regulation 56.2 of the Public Contracts Regulations 2015, as an example, one thing they did do was to allow public authority contractors to refuse tenderers which failed to comply with the various in environmental, social and labour law provisions listed in Annex X to the, uh, Annex 10 rather, to the EU Public Contracts Directive of 2014. Amongst other things, that annex lists ILO Convention 87 on the right to organise and ILO Convention 98 on the right to bargain collectively. These provisions have been excised from the current bill. Schedule 7 doesn't include such international standards as grounds for discretionary exclusion of tenderers, and the list of international agreements in Schedule 9 doesn't include any ILO conventions or indeed any human rights instruments at all. Lords, the UK was the first country to ratify Conventions 87 and 98 in 1948 and 1949, respectively. They became the most fundamental and are now the most ratified of all the conventions of the ILO. The present government might harbour the desire to denounce those conventions as they did 40 years ago with Convention 94, given that the UK has been found to be continuously in breach of them since at least 1989, but it cannot denounce them. It cannot because recently it has committed to, and I quote, respecting, promoting 
and effectively implementing the internationally recognised core labour standards as defined in the fundamental ILO conventions, which are a freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining. And I won't read the rest. Lords, I'm quoting from Article 399 of the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement of last year. That article also reiterates that the government, quote, commits to implementing all the ILO conventions that the United Kingdom and the Member States have respectively ratified, unquote. In the light of that, how can the exclusion in this bill of references to ILO conventions 87 and 98 as a potential basis of refusing tenderers be justified? I ask the noble uh, minister. In conclusion, I wonder if the minister would be prepared to meet uh, to discuss whether and to what extent labour standards might be made conditions for public contracts. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah.